Thank you, everybody, all the students and our, our Black Student Union and African Diaspora Initiative for uh, organizing this event today to commemorate and honor uh, Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. It is my honor and pleasure today to introduce our speaker. Mr. Philonis Floyd was born on June 20, 1981, the fourth child to Mrs. Larsenia Jones, who lived at the time in the Fort Hood Army Base. Raised in the Third Ward area of Houston, Texas, he attended Jack Yates High School and Texas Southern University, pursuing a degree in criminal justice. In 2014, Mr. Floyd started his professional driving career with CR England, one of the nation's largest refrigerated carriers. He later accepted a position with WM Dewey and Son Incorporated, hauling custom pipes to specific destinations. On May 26, 2020, Mr. Floyd learned that his older brother, George, had been murdered by four police officers in Minneapolis after a store clerk alleged that George had passed a counterfeit $20 bill. The world watched as Officer Derek Chauvin knelt on George's neck for eight minutes and 46 seconds. And I think all of us are painfully aware of that point in time. Across the nation and internationally, George's death sparked a worldwide outpouring of protests against police brutality, especially toward black people. The day after George was laid to rest, June 10, 2020, Felonis testified before the US Congress, urging them to do the right thing by passing the Justice in Police Act of 2020 that would bar chokeholds, create a registry to track officers, with serious misconduct records, and lift certain legal protections that make it challenging to hold officers accountable for using excessive force. Philonis's life as a professional transporter drastically changed forever. He vowed that George's death would not be in vain or become just another hashtag on a t-shirt, and he began tirelessly to advocate to change systematic racism and the challenges faced due to police injustice that has for over 400 years led to the harassment and killing of African Americans at the hands of police. Mr. Floyd is currently the founder and president of the Philonis and Keita Floyd Institute for Social Change. The, the Institute's mission is to advance awareness, advocacy, and promote stability within global communities to protect human rights through a commitment to social justice, equity-focused systems, and eradicating systemic racism. Uh, interviewing our speaker today is Dr. Erica Johnson, Professor of Literacies and Composition here at Utah Valley University. For those of you online and here in person, I urge all of us to listen carefully and with open hearts and open minds. And I now pass the microphone to Professor Johnson. So first, I want to say thank you for all of you in the audience for being here. Um, I know you probably you know, have um, essays to write, exams to take. Well, not exams to take, because you wouldn't be here. But <laughs> other academic um, pursuits. So I appreciate you taking the time to actually be here. Um, I also appreciate um, uh, <clears throat> you, Dr. Floyd, I'm uh, sorry, Dr. Floyd, Mr. Floyd, for being here with us and taking um, time out of your day to answer some of these questions. So I appreciate that immensely. I know all of us here in the audience as well. So first, I want to thank you so much for being here with us today as part of Utah Valley University's Martin Luther King Jr. commemoration. Second, I'm very sorry for your loss in the murder of your brother, George Floyd. Before we begin, I must state that the questions I'm going to ask you might be emotionally and psychologically taxing. While they are crafted to be informative and thought-provoking, you may elect not to answer any question that you deem dismissive, trivial, or too intrusive. Okay. So my first question is, what was your brother like as a brother, as a father, as a person? You know, honestly, as a, a brother, father, person, 
I can all put it together. First of all, he was a, a born leader. So in the household, he will always pray with us and always tell us things how, hey, we can do this and we can do that. It was never uh, a time where he thought that we couldn't do what we wanted to do. He, he, he will always tell us nobody can hold you back, only you can hold you back. But looking to him as a father, uh, his daughter loved him. Um, he was always with her when he had the opportunity to. Uh, even when he went off and went to Minnesota, he would still come back and visit her. And um, she loved him. And even after the demise of her brother being murdered, the fact that, you know, she made the statement that my dad's going to change the world. Uh, she believed that as a child. And so many others around the world, they, they're they looking at that and they're seeing the same thing. But the fact that him as a person, uh, I always tell people, he's the only man I know can walk into a room with 50 people in there and will go and greet each individual one at a time. And I used to ask him, why? Why did you do that? And he would look at me and say, look at me. I'm huge. People fear me when they see me. So this is the reason I go and greet everybody to let them know that I'm okay. I'm not a threat. And I understood then why people love him so much because anybody that was wrong around him, they felt protected and they knew that they were going to get a good laugh and they knew that he was going to be able to pray with them and he was going to give them the same knowledge that he gave us. And he was also going to make sure that they went down on themselves because one thing he didn't like for people to sit there and look down on themselves. He wanted people to always be happy and be able to speak out and have fun and stuff. Thank you so much. <clears throat> My next question references an interview you gave this um, in November, posted on the Vermont PBS YouTube. In that interview, you stated that communication is key and knowing how to communicate are keys to ending um, racism and police brutality. What are your thoughts about comments that we should simply stop talking about race and racism? Well, basically, you simply cannot stop talking about race and racism because it is the issue. That's not something that you can sweep up under the rug. So therefore, this will always be a frontier until somebody else solve it. The problem is uh, people see it and people don't want to put it on the back burner. And you have some people who don't want to talk about it, but this is something that you should be talking about. Because to me, if it's tough to talk about, we need to do something about it. Because we should be able to have a conversation any time of day without making somebody mad, making somebody get into their feelings where they don't want to speak with you because of the color of your skin. They don't want to speak with you because they don't want you to have a certain job. It's just at this time of day, it's been 400 years ago when all this stuff was going on. Uh, we are not at that point in time again where we should be worried about going into one restroom where it's only white only and, and black here. Right now, we can actually go to school with each other. We can go into the same restaurants with each other. We can eat at the same restaurants with each other. The more we talk, the more we understand each other. And that's the way I love to put it. Okay, thank you so much. Um, as a follow-up, um, <clears throat> what, um, how would you actually facilitate such conversations? How would you broach those topics for those who are indeed um, resistant to such conversations? Oh, I just walk up to them with my loving and warm heart and let them know that, hey, man, we, we've been through a lot. And it's a time of day where we need to stick together and be able to speak out. Um, I've been going to Congress. I've been all around the world just speaking on my brother's behalf. But not only my brother, people around the world who are having these same issues. Uh, this is a, a national issue. Uh, this is something that's just not just here. It's in America, social media, all of these different uh, places that we can speak out. We need to get out there and speak 
But me personally, just speaking with other people, tell them to read, tell them to get on Google and do research, uh, YouTube. It's there, it's there in your face. You don't even, most people don't even have to read it in a book anymore. If they don't like to read, they can go on YouTube. The fact that it's everywhere and people can physically see it, like they physically seen a 4K picture of my brother being murdered in broad daylight. People can see that. That was something that was a tragedy that people all around the world had to explain that to their kids. So everybody is doing the research. The fact that that video has been seen over 2 billion times. We have a lot of problems. So it's too much out here. And for me, when I speak to people, I tell them all the time. It's in the news. Uh, you can go to probably your school. They have a, probably a diversity program. You can go uh, to city council. You can go anywhere and people will be able to give you knowledge of it. But if they don't want to talk about it, that is a reason to speak up and get others involved because we're stronger in numbers. And the more people that you have ready to facilitate this conversation, it makes it a lot better because speaking to people across and all across the world who may never wanted to speak about a person like my, to myself and how I am now, uh, I feel that. They always leave with a better understanding of where I'm coming from after I speak with those people because I speak from the heart. I can only tell you what I see. Much. Um, as a follow up to your response, can you just tell us a bit about what was the experience of speaking before Congress? Uh, to be honest with you, that was something that I never thought I would do. The fact that I went to the funeral and I was told right then and there after the funeral, I would have to fly out. I never had a chance to grieve with my family. So we flew there on a private jet, thanks to Mr. Tyler Perry. We flew there. And the fact that I had a chance to speak with Congress, seeing people on buildings with AK-47s, we walking in. I, I never knew. I'd never been to Washington, D.C. at that point. But going into there, I was nervous, but I was determined to get my point across. Uh, the fact that I was watching cameraman do anything to get shots of you by rolling on the floor like ninjas. I was, it was, I was heartbroken, but I knew I had to get that message to crowds. I didn't care about a hundred million cameras at the time. All I cared about was accountability for George Floyd, accountability for Dante Wright, who wasn't even murdered at the time, accountability for Breonna Taylor, for Eric Garner, for Pamela Turner, for Jason Sutherland, for both them John. It's so many individuals, Austin Sterling, people who never received accountability and it, we were just so lucky to receive it, just like Ahmaud Arbery and Dante Wright was. They prayed with me, all of these people who I'm bringing up, we all prayed together, their families. And this is what, a lot of this stuff is the reason I do it, but the thing that gave me the strength was, that was my big brother. That was part of my life. I had no choice. Just like anybody else, they will fight for their family members all around the world. Thank you. As another follow up to um, a response um, to a question, um, you stated that it is over, is it 2 billion views of the video? Can you talk a little bit about what is that like to know that over 2 billion people have viewed that particular video? You know, uh, it shows you the fact that 2 billion people want to view a video like that they're sad they're sad that they have to watch they have to watch a video again this was a motion cinema picture broad daylight 4k people all around the world 
witnessed a man being tortured to death for over nine minutes and 29 seconds. You have to think about a fish being out of water the way it just flops around. You have to think about that. You have to think about somebody holding you by your neck where you can't physically breathe. This is something that you can't teach. You know, this is something has to be born in you to do something like that to somebody. Uh, racism is is not one of those things that you just go and you receive. You're taught that. And the fact that it felt, for, my, for me, what I seen, I actually thought my brother was in a grave and they was just throwing dirt on him while he was alive. Because the stuff that I seen, you all couldn't see with his knuckles scarred up while he was fighting to be able to breathe. He, his knuckles was bloody. His nose was clearly like a Brillo pad. It was bloody because he was scraping it, trying to breathe. All of that, those are the reasons that that video was viewed over two billion times because nobody has seen a heinous video like that. The fact that um, you're watching the video uh, and it has made an, an amazing impact all across the world. Uh, my brother's death, it has changed the world. And that's one of the biggest reasons so many people look at that video every day because they can't believe it. They can't believe it. A place here in America where people fight to get to because they always say this is justice or free. This is liberty. This is freedom. But Right now, people around the world are trying to figure it out what's going on because everybody knows who George Floyd is. If you don't know who George Floyd is, you have to be sleeping on a rock. Thank you. Okay, um, <clears throat> my next question is, um, you are now among one of far too many faces of police brutality because not only was your brother killed by a police officer, it was all very public, including the trial which both garnered national and even global attention. As you have graciously agreed to be with us here today, what does this all mean for you or to you to have that be very public and also part of one of the reasons why you're here with us today? Uh, basically, you know, for uh, the past year, uh, we've been through a lot and it's not even done. We've been through a lot individually together, but here we are and we all are still standing, all of us. Um, in the end, it comes down to humanity, past compassion, um, basically your soul. Uh, what are you doing or uh, what are you willing to do for the greater good? So to me, that's, that's the key to everything. It's, about, it's all about you, the person. I get around individuals every day and I speak to them and I let them know that, hey, we're stronger in numbers. It never changes. We're turning our pain into purpose. This is the reason we get out and speak. And I, I'm thinking activists every day because if it weren't for you all, the people who stood out there and walked for George Floyd, who walked for others because we all went to school with each other, it's it's really a great thing, and I, I thank you all so much. Thank you. Um, so this next question, and you've, you've um, approached some of these or broached some of these answers in some of your previous responses, um, and President Tamina has talked about some of the um, initiatives that you've undertaken. But apart from now being a more visible voice of policing change, how has your life been um, impacted? Is there anything you do um, differently um, as a result of your brother being killed by a police officer? And also, how has the media uh, attention impacted your life? Well, it has personally uh, changed my life and forced me to get out and do the footwork. Uh, not just me, my family. Uh, we all get out and do the footwork. And I, like I told you, everybody around the world, we all have adapted around George Floyd uh, because this has been one of the tragedies that shook up the world. The fact that you've seen so many people who have can, became a part of this fraternity. And, and, you know, this is something we didn't ask for. 
this was something that was delivered and fell to our front door. So we had no choice but to get out and speak. Uh, same thing I tell families that's going through what I'm going through. Hey, uh, I can speak for you. Benjamin Crump can speak for you. Reverend Al Sharpton can speak for you. But hey, we can do it, but we need you to get out and speak because you're the only one that can paint that picture of who your sibling was. I just want us to be able to live without fear and hatred. Uh, the daily fear that a lot of us have is like basically we're leaving our homes. Uh, the fact that we have to tell our children to make sure all the doors and the windows are locked and all the windows are rolled down when you get pulled over by a police officer and you're saying, hey, so they won't have to look in the back seat and say they couldn't see what was going on and have a reason to shoot you. Make sure you have your ID in a good place so you'll be able to have it ready so you can have your, your arms free on the wheel and you can pass it to them because the problem still exists. Communication, they have dash cams, they have body cams. The fact that they are willing to cut the body cam off is telling you that something is going on and they're not doing their job the correct way. Okay, thank you. Um, so we have um, the more recent conviction of Kim Potter, the former police officer convicted uh, <clears throat> of manslaughter for fatally shooting Dante Wright in Minnesota. And before that, the murder, uh, the conviction of um, former police officer Amber Geyer for killing Botham Jean in Texas. And then, of course, Derek Chauvin, the police officer convicted for the murder of your brother. Though exceptionally rare, what are your thoughts about is what is seemingly an increase in attempts to hold police officers criminally accountable for their direct actions that cause death? All right. Before I even answer that question, uh, it's not Botham John. I mean, it's not Botham Jean. It's Botham John. And uh, his sister is uh, Alyssa Finley. If she heard you say that, she'd be correcting you. So I was just telling you ahead of time. But... Uh, I honestly think uh, we would like to keep the pressure going. Um, to me, the more pressure that you apply, the better you have a chance with what's going on. Uh, we need to hold everyone accountable, no matter what race, it, no matter what race it is. Uh, I've been in Congress before. I've been sit down and lied to uh, with other families, like uh, Botham John's sister, uh, it's in many more Eric Garner. You lie to all of these families, and all of these families are part of the same fraternity. What I was just explaining, we all was in there with a heavy heart. The fact that we had to go to where our voters, voters' rights, supposed to stand a chance, and we supposed to be willing to be able to make choices and make decisions. The fact that you were only willing to make make uh, laws for the elite and chosen and not for the people with no voices. To me, those are problems. There's no one should be above the law, including police officers. Um, it's like they are, they are like simple human beings that should be, uh, to me personally, they should be treated like human beings just like us. They are not the uh, the judge, the uh, executioner, they, they're, they're, that's not, you can't take the law into your own hands, no matter where you are. Everybody deserves their time in court, and that's under the Constitution. Everybody deserves that. The fact that you have people who are willing to take the law into their own hands, this is the reason Ahmaud Arbery is not here. He was just jogging down the street. This is the reason George is not here. Over a nonviolent crime, a $20 bill, and they still haven't brought that $20 bill up. The fact that I've seen individuals shoot up church houses and they go in and have dinner at Burger King, it shouldn't be a law established for white America and black America. It shouldn't be two justice systems. It should just be one. And this is the reason that we get out and fight. And we have to continue to fight for what is right. 
Okay, thank you so much. And also thank you for the correction um, with regard to, can you say it one more time for me so I can say it correctly? Both of them, John. Both of them, John. Okay, John. Thank you. And I do that because we need to put respect on people's names. So when it's said incorrectly, you need to correctly state it. Okay. Um, <clears throat> so um, and my next question is, as stated, uh, Derek Chauvin, the police officer who um, killed your brother, was convicted of murder and also pled guilty to federal charges of violating your brother's civil rights. Do you think that's justice? Say that again. Oh, sure. Um, as stated, Derek Chauvin, the police officer who um, killed your brother, was convicted of murder, and he also pled guilty to federal charges of violating your brother's civil rights. Do you think that's justice? Uh, it, it would never be justice. Uh, we have to get an understanding. It, it would never be justice for any of these families who get uh, the, the chance to have people convicted. And the reason is, you can't receive justice because you can never bring George back. You can never uh, bring Dante Wright back. You can never bring Ahmaud Arbery back. Uh, the fact that we can't receive accountability, but the fact that we're fighting for something you shouldn't have to fight for, this is something that should be a given. If I steal something out of the store, like a piece of gum, I'm going to jail for it. So the, if you murder somebody, like what you seen with George Floyd, where a camera was right there on the spot, where you had individuals out there begging and pleading and telling them, hey, you shouldn't be doing this. Hey, he can't breathe. My brother had to say this over and over and over again. You had an EMS worker who wanted to resuscitate him. They wouldn't allow that. These are all people who were working for the state who said they were willing to protect and serve. And the fact they didn't protect and serve, that they, they took the law into their own hands, all four of them. You had an officer who was willing to push everybody away and want to make somebody do anything. And they all were saying, hey, this guy can't breathe. You had a child out there. God put all of those people there in one spot there. And there was a reason they were all there. You had a martial arts expert, an MMA fighter, and he said that choco was a blood choco that Mr. Chauvin had on my brother's neck. You had an older guy who had been through all type of racism before because he was born at that time. He could do nothing but plead with him, and he cried when he testified in court because he said, I couldn't save him. And he said it over and over. I couldn't save him. That is hunting those individuals who are out there. And that little eight-year-old child, you don't know if she's going to have PTSD for the rest of her life. The things that people seen and people witness what happened, they can never, it would never be some type of justice for that. All we can do is receive accountability and get out to help others who are having these same problems before they have them and after they have them, because clearly it hasn't stopped. I just was flown to uh, what, Charleston, South Carolina, Jason Sutherland. He was murdered in jail where he was already in custody and they still murdered him. And he had a mental health issue. They tased him 11 times. And he died in there. And nobody's talking about it. Nobody's trying to bring charges on anybody in there. And the video clearly shows that he didn't hit nobody. He didn't do anything to nobody. And he was murdered. That's the problem that we're having. It has to be. And it, 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 this is something that I really look at. It has to be a way that you can make a mistake and not have to lose your life. It has to be a way that these laws can be changed to be able to help other individuals. This is one of the biggest reasons I constantly plead, and I'm steady stating out to America, please pass the George Floyd Police Act. And I talk to Congress all the time, and I can tell you this, and I'm talking to Congress now, don't let this tragedy hit your front door. 
before you were willing to make this decision to help change these laws. The fact that if you could make federal laws to protect the bird, which is the bald eagle, then you can make federal laws to protect people of color. No matter no race, people of color, period, we all should be able to stand as one and be able to be an American citizen, not a second class citizen. Thank you. Um, I heard someone wanting to clap. I want to clap as well. <laughs> Um, for, for those of us who don't have the full details, even though we are all free to Google, um, can you talk to us a bit about, because you mentioned the George Floyd Policing Act, can you talk to us um, a bit about, and talk to us more about what that actually is, what the details are of that act? Oh, um, a lot of it is constantly, it's, it's around what's going on in America, what you see and what all of these uh, people being murdered by police officers. Right, we was talking about communication. It's all about love and being compassionate, but the communication is the key. Police officers, they should automatically be programmed to be able to de-escalate and have communication before they get out there on that scene. So when they're speaking to these individuals, you shouldn't have to put your hands on them. You should be able to hold a conversation. And that can really show you where who has mental health issues or what right then and there. Because if I'm responsive and I'm talking to you and I'm doing what you're telling me to, you shouldn't have to hit me. You shouldn't have to pound me. You shouldn't have to put me on ch in chokeholds. And that's one of the things that in that George Floyd Police Act, the no chokehold, because that has killed numerous people around the world, the no chokehold law. And like the ones that people look at and see a lot is George Floyd and you see Eric Garner. They was like on the top tier for no chokeholds. Also, the no knock warrant. Everybody knows about this. This is Brianna Taylor. She was asleep when the police came to her door and they knocked on it. She don't even know she's dead. That's the fact. She doesn't even know she's dead. She is gone to heaven and she is gone and her mom is still down here facing the same thing that I'm facing. She's wondering when Will this be a place in America for everybody and not just one or two people? The fact that you also have to look at these dash cams, these body cams, they should be on at all times. This is something that we need to get up onto and need to make sure that they always have this stuff on. They need to be facing charges. Anytime you have to turn that off, it should be a reason. It's too much technology out here to understand why? And I know you have all of these people, they can find glitches in anything. They should be able to find a glitch in why that camera was off. Did you cut it off or did it go off on its own? You have so many things about we need to be able to keep track of people going from different states uh, and getting jobs. There's no way it should be somebody in California who murdered somebody and then he go get a job and work at Utah Valley, and he's a murderer, and he does something to one of the students there. We shouldn't have to go through that. Also, we want to end this qualified immunity thing where if you're doing your job the right way, you shouldn't be nervous. You shouldn't be scared, you know? My thing is, if your heart is in the right place at the right time, why should you murder somebody? I, I never I never understood that. I never I never understood why I could be walking by certain people and they would sit there and start locking their doors and rolling up their windows like I'm a problem, like I'm gonna do something to them. My heart is not like that. And to me, if you're gonna be a police officer, you're supposed to go out there knowing that right then and there. You are the law, but you are not above the law. And that's what I want from these police officers. I want them to understand that, hey, we're tired of it. And just like I said in Congress when I was speaking, I'm tired. The world is tired. We're tired of the same thing. This has been happening for over 400 years. And it's not just happening here. This is happening in London. 
This is happening in Brazil. This is happening in Sweden. This is happening in so many different places. South Africa is happening everywhere. And you have celebrities who have talking about it. You have uh, 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 what it was, the Prince. Prince, he talked about it. This is the topic of the world right now. And the only way that this topic can go away, if racism can go away. People just want to be treated equally. Preach. Um, thank you so much. <laughs> okay. Um, apart from the end of police brutality, what do you ultimately hope to achieve as you continue to speak about the your personal intimate um, impact of police brutality, the very public killing of your brother, and the um, national attention of both the killing of your brother and the trial? What do you ultimately hope to come from all of this? And you probably answered some of it in your previous responses, but is there anything specific that you would want to share with us of something um, to come from this? Um, I just want to uh, from take from this is um, the stuff that I preach about every day. I just want to, uh, have you ever have a, a duck season and uh, hunting for deer and things like that? I don't want people around the world to feel like it's open season on them year round. Um, the fact that by me speaking and me feeling like I'm going to use the platform that I have been given to help others, um, I don't want people to think that I'm not here, but I can't help everybody, but I'm trying my best. Um, I get people in my DMs every day, and they all tell me how much they they miss my brother for me and how much they would want to meet him if he was here. Uh, the impact that, you know, it's the people. The people, you know, my family, you know, uh, the way I, I pray so much and I just pray and hope that change will come. Um, the fact that we lost Dr. King in, uh, in 68 in April, the fact that... Uh, we lost Malcolm in 65. We lost JFK in 63. We lost uh, Kennedy in 68 too in June. Uh, I just want liberation. I just want to be able to have change in this world. Uh, me pursuing it, trying my best, um, I'm just asking. And I'm asking anybody in the audience and anybody else that's viewing this through web around the world, let's sit out here and hope and get out here and be active and get this George Floyd Police Act passed. To me, that would be one of the biggest and I think this would be huge for anybody and everybody around the world. We just don't want a watered down bill. We want this bill to be a quality bill, something that can stand for kids to come, the gen generations and the next generation. So we can all be here because to me, it'll never change if we don't start now. The time is now. We want to stop everything that's going on. America needs to start healing. But the fact that if we keep picking at the scab, we'll always be stuck in the same place. And you'll be forever in the same madness around the world. I'm just here now because I have to be the big brother. I have to sit out here and just look for, uh, look to help my brother's kids, look to help other individuals around the world who have kids. And they all are looking at their kids the same way I looked at my brother. That could have been me. That could have been my loved one. And when my brother died, but every mother around the world to look at that video and feel his pain when he yelled, Mama, to me, that was a tragedy, and that is one of the biggest reasons why the world exploded behind George Floyd. To me, that's, that's, that's basically what it is for me.
Thank you so much. So um, just some follow-up questions just based off of uh, your response. Um, you stated that the things that we can do, and you stated specifically with regard to the George Floyd Policing Act. So can you expound a little bit more on specifically what we can do in that regard? Um, is there like a website we can go to? Is there um, somewhere we can write to get more information or emailed or things of that nature? Uh, you have to uh, go to Congress. You have to call constantly. Uh, a lot of people have been calling and trying to get the bill passed. And uh, when they put the bill on the table, it was just sitting there collecting dust and spider webs because they took it away saying that they had to work on their infrastructure bill. And that was more of the filibuster deal. They was just getting it. But me personally, I can tell everybody, if you witness injustice, no matter what bias or prejudice, don't turn a blind eye. Don't allow what happened to my brother to happen to your brother. You know, help put laws in place to protect all citizens. You know, not just for again the elite and the chosen. Uh, get involved. Ask friends. Ask family. Uh, ask neighbors to do as well. Um, with stronger in numbers. And as I continue to speak about it, you always hear me say, it's the only way you can turn your pain into purpose. We're strong in numbers. And basically, I just want to encourage locally uh, with other officials all the way to demand that this bill is passed. Because I'm getting older and Reverend Al is getting older, but I'm going to continue to stay here and fight because this is what I'm fighting for accountability and justice. No other reasons why nobody else should be put on trial when a police officer kills them. The police officer is the one that should be put on trial. Thank you. Um, as one of, because uh, I have two more questions. One of them is <clears throat> if you would share with us, as you were you know, talking about this, as you were um, testifying before Congress, as you were here with us today, can you just briefly talk about, so what is your, what is your self-care when you're dealing with these, you know, continuously talking about these emotionally taxing, psychological taxing um, uh, conversations? What, what is your self-care? What does that look like? Um, the Bible. <laughs> it's, it's all about the Bible for me. Uh, I read it. Um, I uh, speak with my family. Uh, we talk about different things. Uh, we talk about a lot of different things. Basically, the stuff that I do just for me to feel calm, besides going fishing, is actually a banana, like a banana mayonnaise sandwich. I eat those to feel closer to my brother a lot, you know, because that's something that he used to make for us because George couldn't boil water. So, he, you know, that's something that he will always give us. And, um, I think about that all the time. To me, reading, uh, praying, uh, quiet time, you know, that's to me, that's the enjoyment that I get. And that's that's basically it because being able to um, reflect um, off of what my brother will always say, he will always say, hey man, don't, don't let nobody keep you down. He say, God has put you here for a reason. He said, it's a blessing to be here. He, he will always say, people wake up every day with no eyes. They can't see. They're blind. He said, they, they, they can't even speak, you know. He said, you don't have to use Braille. He's like, you got feet. You can walk. You can talk. You can do a lot of things. You can run and jump. He said, it's a blessing just to be here. And the fact that it was a blessing for him to be here and his life was taken away from him, this is one of the reasons that I'm fighting. And this is why I find it uh, better to just pray because I got all my limbs and I can get out and help deliver a message the best way I can. Thank you so much. I will rest later. Um, it is my final question because I want to be you know, cognizant of your time um, and also um, with the um, questions that are coming up later. So my final question here is, with our uh, part of our theme, how do you embrace 
your full humanity, considering what has happened with your, your family and the media attention and speaking about it, um, how do you embrace your full humanity and how might, might we embrace our full humanity? You know, that's, it's strange for me because um, embracing it and stuff like that, but to me, this is, it's just life for me. Um, I know I can't get my brother back. So the media attention and all that stuff, I don't even think about that. The fact that other families come to me and they tell me about, hey, man, you got media attention, you got this, you have that. They don't have it. That's why I'm working as hard as I am, because I'm looking at the people who this tragedy hasn't hit, but I'm also looking at the paternity of the people who it has happened to. Like Pamela Turner, she's just getting a court date. They didn't want a, a, her to have a court date. This woman was shot physically by a police officer in broad daylight right there on the ground. They showed it, pow, pow, pow. He shot her numerous times. And this was a man shooting a woman with all the weapons. He just shot her. Um, it's like by being kind and um, having empathy for others, um, it's just like listening, caring, respecting others. Uh, to me, this is this is why we are here. Uh, we're here to make an impact. Uh, just like the students at the school, you know, they go there to get an education. They go there to learn, and they run across individuals I know that's not even their race. But you're all one because you might not be the smartest, but this person can help you. But if you're willing to speak with that person, I guarantee that person can teach you a lot of things about that nationality that you didn't know. And you can tell them so much. And that's the reason I keep saying communication pre presents information. And inf the only way to get information is communication. And that's how you learn about other individuals. That's how you learn about different cultures. That's how you learn what respect is, because Aretha Franklin said all you need is a little bit of respect, and she was in civil rights at the time. Thank you so much, uh, and I like that that phrasing. Um, what is it? Communication presents information. 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 Thank you so much. Um, and I that was actually my my last question. Uh, we have a few more minutes before um, we get to um, the next part of the event today. But I want to take that time to say once again, thank you so much uh, for taking your time to be with us here today. Thank you so much for um, answering the questions and providing us with a wealth of, of information. I know I feel more informed um, by, you know, conversing with you um, than I did before sitting down in this chair. Um, I want to state that I honored and privileged um, that I was even asked to do this. Um, and it was a committee of, of individuals. And I said, yes, like, of course, why wouldn't I? Um, so again, thank you so much for, for taking your time. Um, I do appreciate it, as we all do We're here in the audience, which that would actually be um, the next part of the event today, where we have uh, Dr. Kyle Reyes, who will be facilitating some questions um, from the audience. So once again, um, thank you so much, and I hope we can all give you, uh, Mr. Floyd, a round of applause for this. I just want to thank you all for just having me here. Uh, it's an honor to be here, just to be able to share the life of my brother and who he was and the things that we can present. But when I leave, I love to just always make this statement. If you can make federal laws to protect people of color, then you can make federal law. Uh, I mean, if you can make federal laws to protect the bird, which is the bald eagle, then you can make federal laws to protect people of color. That's my honest thing. I thank you all so much for having me here. Well, thank you so much. Uh, and and we, we'd like to start this uh, Q&A session. Um, we first want to thank, again, Dr. Erica Johnson for having a conversation and for your time um, um, in terms of sharing the stories and sharing the thoughts that you did in our last session. 
The questions that have come in, uh, Mr. Floyd, are questions that have come in from our students, our faculty and staff, mm -hmm. and even some community members. Um, there's some questions that uh, I'll just read directly and others that I'll interject and might do a follow-up on. Uh, just to introduce myself to you, so nice to meet you. My name is Kyle Reyes. I serve as the Vice President of Student Affairs here at UVU, and um, mm -hmm. I just appreciate the thoughts that you've already shared. Let me just jump into um, uh, one of the things that Erica pointed out at the beginning of her session, and that is, if there's ever a question on here that for whatever reason you just decline and you, you, you'd say, let's go to the next one, we honor that and we will, and I'll move to the next one. So uh, with that, one of the questions that have come in, that the first questions that came in was, could you tell us of what life was like when you were young? To kind of tell us a little bit about growing up. And I believe it was near Houston. Uh, and maybe tell us a little bit about your family, you and George growing up and, and others that were part of your family there. Okay. Uh, coming up, uh, we were poor. Uh, the things that a lot of people had, we didn't have, but you couldn't tell because the way we were with each other. So when we received the Nintendo, I'm sure everybody around the community who had a Nintendo was blowing in the cartridges and like pushing them down to make it play continuously until it played. Uh, we would do things like that with each other. Uh, we were playing double dribble and take mobile. Um, see, this is like extra stuff to do besides when we were playing with each other and going around like in the community and having fun. The things about growing up watching my brother, um, I had to ask my mom because I didn't know at first. Uh, it was some little lines on the wall. And I used to see them, but I never would ask about them. So until one day I just asked my mom, said, Mama, why uh, we got all these little scratches on the wall? And she said, George would do that because he always wanted to be taller. So he will always measure his height uh, against the wall. So he had that complex that where he wanted to be taller so he can be one of the best basketball players ever because that's something that he loved. So um, growing up with him, uh, us uh, being around our mom, cooking, well, he didn't know how to cook. He didn't care too much about that. But me, I used to watch my mom cook, and I used to cook breakfast sometimes in the morning. Uh, my youngest brother would do the same thing. he will wake up and cook breakfast. Um, we didn't want to be stuck like George and only just know how to make banana mayonnaise sandwiches. We wanted to make other stuff. Uh, the thing about a lot of stuff, I taught George, uh, like when it came to fishing, he's scared of insects, he's scared of bugs. Uh, when we went fishing, I would have to put the shrimp on his hook because we, we went saltwater fishing more than anything. And uh, when he did catch a fish, sometimes he would jerk back too hard and he would lose it. I still remember when the hook came out and got stuck in his shirt and he started hollering and screaming because of the hook being in his shirt. He he was scared of things like that. Um, just for you all, just if you all could, I could just take you all back where I have a camera and showing you the flying cockroach, the uh, cockroach that come from outside off the tree and made it in the house and it was just flying and George was scared to death. So the way the stairs were, the door was right there. So I told him, I said, I hold the door open and you just want full speed to get out of the house because he wanted to go outside. He had took a running start and jumped all the way down the stairs and ran out the door <laughs> and landed. But I was like, wow, people do anything when they got fear in their heart. <laughs> so George was man, growing up with him, me and my brothers and my sisters, watching my sisters uh, put finger waves in, in their heads. Uh, stuff that you all might not see, my sisters, they put the finger waves in their head. They did something called water bottles. I don't know, something like that, some kind of style. But the stuff that TLC them had in the videos and stuff, they would do stuff like that. So uh, my brother, 
and us together, we were one, you know, uh, we were united as one. Uh, that's something that my mom will always promote. Uh, we will always have food because we all played football and basketball and stuff. So when we came home, we knew it was going to be in the oven and she was going to have it there. But we all knew the biggest plate was George's plate. But if it was something good, <laughs> we would take a piece of chicken off his plate and have to suffer the consequences later. Because <laughs> he would he would be like, man, somebody ate my chicken. Somebody ate my chicken. And we were like, it's some cereal up there. It was some cereal. And George, he didn't like, he didn't too much like cereal that often. But when he did eat them, he would eat a bowl of them, like a big cake bowl that you make a cake in. He would pour all of them in there and pour all that milk in there and just eat and just eat them. But uh, it's it's so much I can talk about. Uh, matter of fact, when we were so poor, the fact that I know a lot of people went through this when every day you will wash like the same pair of socks or a couple of pair of socks inside the, uh, the water faucet in the bathroom. I would wash my socks and then I would hang them on a the hot water heater, stuff like that. We would do things like that. And that's to keep us from having to go to the washing chair because the washing chair was far. So <laughs> we would try to wash socks every day, wash underwear every day, uh, just different things like that. That, that was our household uh, until we received the money to get what we wanted. Yeah. I, I do have a follow-up question on that, but really quickly, just to let you know, on Tech Mobile, Bo Jackson, on Tech Mobile, <laughs> all day. I I played Tech You're Mobile. Right. And, You're right. He right? shakes everybody off. Him and Walter Payton. <laughs> yeah, Walter Payton. You couldn't you couldn't tackle him anyway. Um, along the lines of this, and and and. and uh, we started with these particular questions, Mr. Floyd, because I think in the last session, in the conversation with Dr. Johnson, right, we, we, we talked a lot more about the more prominent discussions uh, a bit on, on the George Floyd that we were introduced to because of the tragedy. But rarely have we been able to have exposure to the family and a bit more of the childhood. And so the second question goes to that as well, and that is, what were your aspirations? I mean, you talked a little bit about your, your childhood, what the family was like, a few of the, the things there. But one of the questions is, what, what were some of the things that you and George and your other siblings, you aspired to, what you hoped for, you wanted to be when you grew up? Oh, me? Uh, I had so many different things that I wanted to be. I never wanted to be a truck driver, but I found out that this was the best thing that I ever did with drive a truck because I got to see the world just from states I have been through Utah because CR England is based out of Utah so I literally that's where I went and I had to show them that I knew how to bag up and do certain things even though I had already got my license they still made me go out on the road with a driver but they wanted to show wanted me to show them I was up to their standards after because I still needed to drive on my own. I was with somebody else who was showing me the way or what I needed to do when I went to fuel pumps, things like that. <clears throat> the fact that uh, I used to always want to be uh, a doctor. I used to always tell my mother I wanted to be a doctor. Uh, and then I always tell her I wanted to be somebody that invent different things. But uh, the fact that truck driving is something that I love and I cherish that right now when people talk about it I'm able to speak about it and the fact that when teachers tell you you can't make a living looking out the window they lie because you can make a living <laughs> looking out the window and uh, my brother he always wanted to be a, a professional uh, basketball player or football player he always wanted that and um, when it comes to my sister, my sister always wanted to sing. Um, she loved Whitney Houston. She used to always sing a lot of her songs all the time. My other sister used to listen to everything from Bon Jovi to, um, what's that lady's name? She listened to a lot of rock and roll bands. But Bon Jovi is the one that she loves the most. And I still remember singing Shot to the, uh, Shot to the Heart. I think that's 
and, and I used to always have the broom and I used to be in the house acting like I was Bon Jovi with her and stuff like that. So George, all of us, we would do that. We would interact and we would act like we was Bon Jovi them. And we would do that with my sister because that was that was fun to us at that time. And uh, my youngest brother, he too much didn't talk about a lot of things. He always used to say, just give me the video game and let me play. <laughs> you know what I mean? So all of us together is one. The only thing that my youngest brother did like to do was he would come and do Bon Jovi too with us because my sister loved Bon Jovi and we would listen to Bon Jovi and it's just stuck in my head. I was listening to Bon Jovi probably a couple of days ago. So <laughs> Nice. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and as you talk about George, uh, we're, you know, we're learning a little bit more about his personality, um, a little bit more about his life. Um, I'm a younger brother. You know, I've got an older mm-hmm. sister. I've got an older brother. Um, there are things that I liked, some things that I wanted to learn from them and other things that I didn't. But what are some uh, lessons you learned from, from George or that you, um, you looked up to? Uh just looking up to my brother, praying. Uh, that to me, that's like the biggest asset that I received from my brother. Uh, he will always say, "Pray about anything. Pray about everything." He always used to say, uh, "One roof, one fam." You know, um, he was one of those guys that he pretty much because my mom's spirit, she put that in us when. People used to, because we were poor in the area, so I don't know if you know what a chili bowl is. They would put the, the moms didn't have enough money to pay for a haircut, so they would put the bowl on the kid's head, and they would trim it, yeah, all the way around. And George didn't want them, because the kids would literally be crying and didn't want to go to school, because they didn't want to be talked about and stuff like that. So George would cut their hair for them. He didn't even know he can cut that good. Until he went and borrowed somebody clippers and started cutting their hair, and people started asking him where did they get their hair cut from. And I started running over there telling him to cut my hair, <laughs> you know. So, uh, George, man, just just thinking about a lot of the stuff with him. That's to me one of the things that set set apart uh, him from a lot of people, helping helping others. Uh, people will always ask him for things. The only thing about George that I'm glad that I didn't have to do uh, was when I walk inside of a door, I didn't have to bend down. He would have to do that into a lot of doors. He would have to bend down. He would have to go greet everybody across the room. I can walk in the room and say, hey, how y'all doing? How y'all doing? And people be like, hey, hey, hey. But him, when he walks in, he's so huge. I'm like, man, that's a big old dude. And then he walks, hey, he be greeting everybody, pulling people to him and patting them on the back. And the people, mom, the fathers, they all fall in love with him. But it's easy to fall in love with somebody that's, that's bigger than you because you're always intrigued when you're looking at them. And you're like, man, this is a big old giant, you know, a nice person. Um, one of the questions that came in, by the way, thank you. Um, uh, one of the ex- questions that came in is, in commemoration of Dr. Martin Luther King week, this week, with everything he stood for and fought for, um, how do you think he would feel about where we're at right now and in, in our status of the country and some of the things he fought oh, for? You know, the fact that uh, Dr. King fought so hard, uh, this has been happening for over 400 years. Uh, I think that the progress of me just trying to continue to like work with government officials and law enforcement to find like uh, healthy solutions uh, for injustice across America. I think that's something that he would be proud of because this is some of the things that he was fighting for. Uh, He was also fighting for like continuing to like bring awareness and advocating for families, you know, all across this world due to the injustice. You know, uh, Dr. King, he had a dream that everybody around the world would join hands together. And I can honestly say we did that. When George died, people all around the world, no matter no nationality, they all knew that that was wrong. Uh, 
everybody spoke out. And the thing that got me the most was the Amish came out. And the Amish, you know, they they don't watch stuff like that. They just, they all came out and they all protested. And we all stood in solidarity as one. Uh, Dr. King, he was one of those people who uh, was was into getting America to understand that uh, Black people are humans and we deserve to be treated as one. Uh, that's why people marching uh, and they're con- constantly doing it every day. And the fact that I uh, went up to Congress and spoke, I wasn't just speaking for George. I was speaking for all nationalities of the world, any people, uh, people of color around the world, anybody who thinks that they are treated as a second class citizen. That's who I was speaking for. That's powerful. Um, You know, one of the things that we that we have had conversations about over the past couple of years um, here at the university uh, has been the intersection of identities and marginalization overall, and that it's not just one particular identity that's suffering more than another, and yet we have to recognize some of the historical um, injustices. Thank you, Mr. Floyd. Um, another question that came in here, and this is, this is two parts, so let me see if I can set this up in the right way here. Living in a country where that seems like we take three steps forward and five steps back when it comes to racial inequality and social injustice towards people of color. How do we continue to press forward toward Dr. King's vision and our vision as people of color of a better future? That's the question, and they ask in particular, how do you press forward? So how do we all press forward and how do you press forward? We all have to press forward as one. Uh, the same way I wake up every day and I pray and I thank God for giving me eyes, feet, lips, you know, things that normal people probably don't have because a lot of people are born without. Um, I just want people to always just speak up, you know. Uh, if you witness injustice, no matter your bias or prejudice, don't turn a blind eye to it. Uh, don't allow what happened to my brother to become your brother. Just keep fighting, you know. I just want people to just keep fighting for change. Just, we got to help put these laws in place. We got to just make it clearly and sounded that we're not going anywhere. We're going to continue to beat here. Um, I always say it, and I'm continue to say it, but stronger in numbers. And there has to be a better way to serve and protect. And to me, I mean, there has to be a better system that allows us to be able to make mistakes and still get to live. This is why we fight. This is why we are in the forefront because people make laws all the time. The past that George Floyd Policing Act make other people feel comfortable. That's what we need. Thank you. Uh, yeah, keep going. Oh, because I want to say, me personally, I think about the, the police reform. And I think this is something that we need to just stick to. Uh, to me, I think reform is possible if we weed out all the bad apples. You know, uh, every time a cop kills a, a black person, like, a lot of boys in blues, they, they, they go silent. A lot of police officers, they just go silent. And that's a whole lot of bad apples. So my thing is this. Um, I just think that the system is, like, basically fundamentally broken. But I think we can fix that. We just need other people that's willing to cooperate and think like us. You know, this is why so many people around the world took extreme measures. People are tired of this system that are killing people because of the color of their skin. My skin is not a weapon. This is what I was given. This is what I was born with. So out the womb, you don't even know what color you are. You just know you're here. But the fact that you have other individuals, which could be your mom, your uncle, your brother, whoever it is telling you, hey, 
you're privileged and nobody else is not privileged. This is what we have to get done. This is what we have to talk to our community about. I love that you said th three or four times in the last conversation with Dr. Johnson, you, you talked about conversation, getting engaged. You know, one of the things that on a university campus, the very reason why we have you here today is to start more conversations or to continue conversations. Um, you know, in terms of teaching one another, how, how have you found, and I'll read the, the, the question directly, how do you best teach your family, specifically children, about heavy topics such as racism in hope that one day they'll be able to stand against it? First of all, I tell them to pray. And I, I start kids off when they're young, telling them to pray because God is going to always be there. Um, he's never going to change. It's going to always be listening. But even if we out there, we're walking and we're talking and we always saying, I can't breathe. We, we want justice. Uh, we, you know, everybody is, is out there marching. And you hear a lot of people say no justice, no peace over and over again. They all just want to be loved just like any other individual around this world. We're all speaking with heavy hearts. And the fact that when my brother went down, the world felt like they lost a brother too. Every mom heard my brother scream. And when he said, mama, all mothers felt their pain. I don't care who it was. You could be white, black, blue, brown, whatever color it is. If you had a soul, if you had a heart, the humanity in you would not let you not understand that that man's life was being taken from him. And the fact that people viewed that video over two billion times, this is the reason I get out and I speak to all my nieces and nephews because it's not going anywhere. You're going to see it on T-shirts. You're going to see it at the news. You're going to see it on social media outlets. It's everywhere. And the topic still stands. What are we going to do about it? And all I can do is tell them, hey, you're black. You know, I know you're not treated like anybody else in the world, but I'm going to tell you something. This is my little grandchild that told me this when she went to school. But you have to understand, she's only four years of age. And we gave her some money to go to school and she uh, came back and we were like, what did you do today? And her mom asked her when she asked her that question, she couldn't say too much what she did with the money. And she said, well, I, I lost it. I don't have it anymore. And she said, no, you don't. You don't lose money. Where the money at? And she's four. She said, well, if I tell you something, you won't get mad. And she said, no, I'm not going to get mad. Well, the kids won't play with me. And I seen this little boy, so I told him I'd give him the money to play with me. But the school that she goes to is all Caucasian people. It's not really any uh, African-American people there. And the fact that this happened in Richmond, Texas, uh, it's, it's really disturbing to me that my little grandbaby had to give up her money for somebody to play with her. And she's a child. But she just wanted to play at school. And she felt that was the only way that she can have fun. But she's one of a kind. I can tell you that. That little grandbaby. She is she's super smart. And she probably can tell you what you're thinking before you tell her. <laughs> can you tell us a little bit more about the initiatives and programs, the, the nonprofits, the, 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 the efforts that you're embarking on um, both nationally and globally? Okay. Uh, it's just, um, I had started my own like institution. I don't know if you can see it. You see George is in the middle. He's inside of a lion. So half is the lion yeah. and half is him. This is the Jack A. Lions mascot for the high school that we went to. They named the stadium after him. But I started an institution and this is the, the logo. And wow. it's called Pack Fish. But the thing about it is we're going around, we're preaching and we're letting people know that uh, we want police reform. We want uh, to talk to people about sex trafficking. We want to be able to talk about mental health uh, issues. Uh, these are some of the biggest issues that are going on today. And uh, we're talking about 
uh, immunity, you know, qualified immunity with police officers. We just want people to be able to live in a world that they'll be able to uh, have their gener- you know, kids from this generation to the next generation be okay and not have to worry about systemic racism, uh, being murdered, just different things. Uh, I can talk about stuff all day. I can tell you about uh, when I was in Minnesota, I had met a woman who was, uh, she was uh, from, I think, Ethiopia. And she was telling me how when she moved to Minnesota, she wanted a job and she put her name, she was a doctor, she put her name up there and she would never get hired. And the fact that somebody had to tell her you had to change her name. And the woman went and changed her name. And that's when she received the call. And she told me that's one of the biggest reasons that she's leaving Minnesota is for that particular reason. Uh, it's a lot of problems. And no matter where you go, you don't know where the bad and where they're good. You got good people, you got bad people. You shouldn't have to sort them out in the same way with police officers. You got good ones and you got bad ones. You shouldn't have to sort them out. So, uh, to me, this is why this is why I'm here to shed light on dark situations. Yeah, thank you. One of the students wrote in and asked, you know, what can we do as students to try to help the um, the George Floyd Policing Act pass in the Senate? I mean, can you give us a status of where that is right now and how it, where, where that support is coming from in terms of certain? I mean, is it is it divided among the states right now? I mean, what can students do? The, it's in the Senate right now, but they put it off the table and it's basically like they just threw it in the trash because they put it was a filibuster act. Uh, they wanted the infrastructure. That's what they wanted to talk about. The fact that. Um, I went to Congress and I spoke with Lindsey Graham. I spoke with Timothy Eugene Scott, and they both said, hey, we're going to do everything we can, especially Lindsey Graham, to pass this bill because we know we know what's going on in the world and we want to make change. The fact that it wasn't just me, it was Bolton John, it was Eric Garner's mom, it was, uh, you know, when they say hands up, don't shoot. Uh, it was so many different people in there, and you lied to these families. So what I'm telling you all, to, if you all can call down to Washington, uh, to the Senate, uh, if you can write letters, do stuff like that to get involved, uh, even if you all wanted to protest, you know, you can do it peacefully. The fact that I've seen individuals do things peacefully and like Black Lives Matter, they did it, they protested peacefully, but people came there and attacked them uh, and they didn't want them there. The fact that you look at all the insurrectionists, they was breaking into buildings and were doing all type of stuff and nobody even shot them. Nobody even tried to take people down and put them in jail. The fact that you made it into the place what we call the White House, where it's supposed to be where all of our voting rights are supposed to be able to change the way people think in this world. We have some problems, so I need you all to be able to just step up and be able to call or be able to get up and send letters or get out if you want to and protest. And I know during this pandemic, so many individuals have gotten out and marched because they all want to change. And people put their lives on the line every day because they say what happened to George Floyd, I don't want that to happen to me. And I don't want that to happen to anybody else around this world. You brought up um, peaceful protests. You brought up Black Lives Matter. Um, let me ask a question here that came in from one of our students. Um, how can you respectfully respond to someone that claims all lives matter or blue lives matter whenever you try to promote black lives matter? The most respectful thing you can do is just be who you are. You, for you to say that, that's let me know that you're affectionate, you're compassionate, you want everybody to be able to be treated equal. 
The fact that an individual tells you things about blue lives matter, I think their lives do matter. But also I think that they need to understand that other people's lives matter. The problems that they are having now when they're getting incarcerated now, like Mr. Chauvin, and he's going for federal time, and these other officers have to stand up, the time now is a time for change, because no matter what's going on, these other officers, they're going to turn on you, and they're going to tell on you anyway, because most of these people, they don't know um, that they're doing wrong at the time, but if you see somebody doing wrong, it's your it's your job to de-escalate. So when they say blue lives matter, all lives matter, I agree. Everybody lives matter. But show it to me that everybody lives matter. Because every time I look at the TV, every day I see something happening. Somebody dying in jail due to a police officer or uh, either using the stun gun or something like that to tase them and kill them. or if you look at out here that shooting in different states, people have been killed all around the world for the same thing. So the easiest way to even show me what you're talking about is show it to me. We don't have to talk about anything. Show it to me. And that's how you know blue lives matter. All lives matter. Because if you feel all lives matter, you should care about the movement of black lives matter. We need change. I appreciate that response. Um, it's it's one that um, has come up an, over and over again and, and has divided communities and families, and yet your response is much more of an invitation, and I appreciate the, mm -hmm. the show me aspect of it. Uh, we have time, Mr. Floyd, uh, Philonis, for just a couple more questions. Um, <laughs> many more have come in. Uh, there's a lot of questions on here, by the way, but just two more questions, and then, and then I want to just issue a thank you to you on behalf of the university. Um, what you mentioned, and this is a question that, um, you know, You've already mentioned uh, the sandwiches that you make to remember George, right? Because he didn't know how to boil water real well. Um, what else do you do to remember your brother's legacy and honor him in your own home? I mean, you've talked about your, your activism and, and, and those types of things, but is there something very personal that you do? Um, you may not even want to share it here, but it, to, to honor the student's question, what do you do in your home to honor your brother's legacy? Uh, that's really like like you just said. Uh, I I hate to say it. I I, I cry sometimes. Uh, just just thinking about him. Uh, he, you know, I know that I, I miss him and so many other individuals that known him all around the world. They miss him. You know, my brother played against Yao Ming before before Yao Ming was in the uh, NBA, and the fact that you had so many people that was respected athletes that used to come by the house and they used to all talk to him and uh, always say things to him. They miss him because when people see what happened to George, everybody around that knew us said, that's not him. George is not like that because we know a lot of people that do negative things and how to hurt you and kill you and stuff like that. But the fact that, Everybody gets laughs out of George. I, I think about stuff like that. I, I think about us having those long talks while we're driving down the street. I'm an 18 wheeler and he's talking to me on the phone and he's asking me questions about, hey, how do I do this and how do I do that? It made me feel good because it's my big brother asking me how to do this and how to do that. And he practically taught me a lot of different things. But the fact that I had more knowledge than him when it came to 18 wheelers, it made me feel good. And the fact that we watched basketball and football and we talked about stuff like this over the phone. We had Bible study over the phone a lot of times. Uh, the fact that in the neighborhood that we grew up in, it was a pastor who would come and have church there and nobody really would attend the church and it would be outside. The fact that George went and sat down and the whole community came out to have church with the pastor, he was like, man, George was special because he said he don't know many men that can make a lot of people, especially in poverty, 
come out and just sit and want to have church. Because I always tell people all the time, put guns down and let's have a conversation. Because if we can have a conversation, we can have uh, de-escalate things, and that's how you receive information. Communication equals information, and information equals communication. That's the way I live. That's my logic. Mm -hmm. um, thank you. Uh, well, you know, Dr. Johnson finished the last session by asking you about self-care. I thought it was a great question because I was I was actually curious myself. But let me finish with a question here from uh, with from one of the students who, you know, as there's a there's a professor at a at a university nearby us in the University of Utah. His name is William Smith, who talked about racial battle fatigue. And in racial battle fatigue, uh, Dr. Smith argues that there are certain things that are happening in our society that uh, people of color face that they can't even explain that they're tired. They just face certain hit after hit after hit. Um, what would you, here's the question, what would you suggest for building resiliency when it comes to marginalized identity for UVU students? If any of our UVU students are feeling, for whatever reason, battle fatigue of any identity, marginalization in any way, what, what would you suggest for helping them to build resiliency? Um, you have to speak with somebody. You have to speak with somebody to me if, at that school, they would have to speak to somebody like you, Doc. Uh, they need somebody to talk to because uh, one thing I know, most students there, they might not uh, be from there. So they're going to school out there. So they would have to have individuals surrounding them to show the love to them because you can talk to people over the phone all the time. But when you actually have somebody in front of you showing you that they care, inviting you places, to come around them because the fact that it's a lot of places you go to just because you don't look like them, just because you don't talk like them, nobody wants to be around you. And it, and it's, it's like, it's, you can see it. Nobody wants to be around you, but if you open up the doors and make people more comfortable to be able to talk to you, I guarantee it'll be easier because the more you can learn about another person, makes you comfortable. But when that person doesn't want to open up and they want to go into corners because they figure, hey, I shouldn't talk to you because of your color or anything like that, it causes a lot of problems. And I don't like the fact that I see in schools a lot of bombing and shooting and stuff like that. And I always ask myself what made those people do those things. I wonder what they loved. I wonder did they just need a hug at the time. Because most people need a hug at the time. I, I, and it's, it's something that I can't explain because I really don't know. But from my perspective, um, I just like, basically, I'm just here to seek help with someone that needs the support. Um, to me, that's clearly what I want to do. I want to be able to help. And I think if they have individuals surrounding them who are willing to speak with them because your mental health is everything and you can't always fix yourself so you need doctors <laughs> just like you doc uh they make psychiatrists everybody everybody needs someone to talk to it's just what we're here for somebody that's alone you i don't know the name of the movie but it's the movie with tom hanks when he was on that island by himself and he took that coconut and he put hair and stuff on it. He needed somebody to talk to because he was driving himself crazy. And I think that is what opened up doors for other people to get to know who you are, what you're standing for. Because you can be the sweetest person in the world, but if nobody gives you that chance to be able to explain and embrace you, you'll never be able to get that out. Well, look, let me just say... Um... A couple of things to end here. First and foremost, thank you for your time. Um, you've embodied here what our theme is all about um, in terms of, at the end of the day, strength to love and, and, and pushing towards humanity. Um, I've heard of a, a number of themes come through in your remarks in both sessions. Um, engaging, great conversation, um, and then to just have a, to build connections. We appreciate it. Um, 
As we open this, and I'll close with this as well, on behalf of the university, we are so sorry for the loss of George Floyd. Um, and also, in that same vein, applaud your efforts and, and so many of the efforts that have, that have transpired since then to make lasting change. I'll leave with two invitations. Uh, Philonis, you have a standing invitation. When all this COVID stuff clears, we want you on campus. We want you to come by, break bread, have some food with us, play some tech mobile. I'll find a way. All right. <laughs> and, 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 and host you on campus. And uh, since you're already familiar with Utah, with your, with your truck route, you know how to get here. Mm -hmm. You know where we are. And we're, we're 40 miles south of Salt Lake. We want you here on campus. Uh, but also, I want to just here as well with you to thank our, our um, MLK Commemoration Committee. Uh, you've been in touch with Jerome Corelli, the direct program director of our African Diaspora Initiative. Um, we are trying to make change on this campus as well. And, and you were the perfect speaker and, and, and person to bring for this year. And so thank you for helping us commemorate the legacy of Dr. King and for your time. Please join me in a round of applause for Mr. Floyd. I, I can't hear you. <laughs> I, I want to just thank you all, too, for just allowing me to be here. This is something that I never thought I would be doing. I never thought I'd be able to speak to a university about social justice, about compassion, about people willing to stand up and help with what's going on. And I want to thank any individual who has watched this, all the people who are stepping in, putting their lives on the line during pandemic to sit here and watch it in person. This is something that's to my heart right now. And I can tell you this honestly, I am Falonis Floyd, and it doesn't matter what happens, this system is never going to break my faith. One more round of applause. Thanks, Falonis.